There are a few seats around the edges at the back. Welcome, everybody. Uh, and we will also be live streaming this session into Lecture Theatre 2. So anybody who is standing, if you'd like a seat and to watch live from Lecture Theatre 2, that's also an option. Good morning to all of you and a big welcome to the Blavatnik School of Government. I'm Nairi Woods, uh, Dean of the School, and it's a real pleasure to invite you to this, I think I should have checked this, I think it's our eighth Challenges of Government conference. Um, and every year what we like to do is bring together leaders from different sectors, politics, from the public sector, from the private sector, from the not-for-profit sector, academics and scholars, to really take on what we think are one of the, some of the most important challenges that governments around the world are facing. And we're thrilled to have you all. Some of you are repeat offenders, so welcome back. Um, and some of you here today are obviously our own Master of Public Policy students here in the Blavatnik School or doctoral students or researchers. Can I ask those of you who are part of the Blavatnik School at the moment, studying or researching here, to, to stand up in a second so that our guests know who you are and can come and ask you important questions like, where do I get a glass of water? <laughs> What's it like studying here? How do I get in? Um, so if you'd like to just stand and say a big welcome with me. So faculty, students of the school, so there's your local guides, you know, turn, take a look at them. They're the people to ask. Um, terrific, thank you. Can I say to those standing, if you want a comfortable seat to watch, it's being live streamed into the other lecture theatre, and the minute we go to questions, you can come um, back into the back and wave your hand, and we'll give you priority to throw in a question um, or your comment on the first panel. Terrific. So, for those of you that don't know, this Blavatnik School of Government is the youngest person in the room. So we are, we are, of course, looking at the new generations in this conference. But this school is the newest of all. So we're eight years old. And it's a school that was founded by a group of us here at Oxford University because we really felt that this, the world's greatest university on the indices that we choose to look at, and, <laughs> and which we will choose to ignore when it no longer says that, <laughs> this is the world's greatest university, could do yet more to help governments around the world and to help them in three ways. To help them by starting to really look for and identify people who have not just the intellectual capability, but the vision of public service and the evidence of ability to actually get things done, the resilience and energy to get things done, um, to come to study here and to help them acquire the skills, the analysis, the knowledge, the depth of synthesis and the global networks of peers who, who also want to bring about change to go back and lead differently in their countries. And that's the first thing that this school does. We work with current leaders in short courses. We work with future and current leaders in our one-year Master of Public Policy. We work with researchers who are keen to do really applied and practical research, who are doing either the doctorate or who are research fellows or faculty in the school. And that's the second thing that the school does, is research. Um, but research with a real urgency to, to, to think about what it is that that governments most need to understand better. What's the evidence, what's the thinking, what's the shaping and framing that governments need to do if they're going to do better? Our starting proposition was a simple one, which is that no matter where you are in the world, a very small improvement in government can change lives for millions of people. And that's a very, very important thing, that we can work, we can, 
Yes, we can build startups, and over the next two days, we're going to hear about some fantastic initiatives that are being done in countries. But in the end, the elephant in all of our rooms is government itself, which has the reach and capability to really do good by millions, or alternatively, not to. Not just sometimes to focus on the fact that government can do bad, but actually when it's not doing good, it's missing this massive opportunity to improve lives. And the third thing this school is really committed to is bringing people together who have different views and helping them forge cooperative solutions. You can disagree with somebody about a lot of things, but it's by forging common purpose with people with whom you disagree that you can create really lasting change. And we try to do that in everything that we do at the school. And it's hard, and it's becoming harder and harder in a world where people are preferring to shout at one another rather than to try to work out, okay, we disagree about 99% of things, but on the 1% of things that we agree about, why don't we do something positive together? Why don't we use our energy to do something positive rather than waste our energy simply screaming at each other? And I think for everyone in this room, every society in the world is facing that issue. And that's one of the issues, too, that we'll be looking at over these two days. So I'm going to, I'm going to turn the microphone over to um, Professor Thomas Hale, one of the faculty of the school who's taken a lead in putting today's conference together and will tell you a little bit more about the themes. But let me just close by saying with your, I should have started by saying your excellencies, we're thrilled to have several ambassadors in the room, a very special welcome to you. We're thrilled to have our alumni in the room, a very warm welcome back to you. And we're thrilled to have both old friends and new friends. And we hope that by Friday, um, late afternoon, you will all have been become properly part of the Blavatnik School of Government family. Um, I look forward to that. Thank you for being here, and I'll turn over to Tom Hale. Thank you, Nare, and thank you to all of you. Let me add my welcome. We're so excited to have so many interesting speakers and also participants here with us over the next few days. Our theme at this conference, this Challenges of Government conference, is the new generations. And I think we'd all probably agree there's an interesting generational shift happening all over the world in different areas of politics, in different areas of the challenges that governments face. And there's also a lot, I think we'd all agree, of, shall we say, shallow commentary in media on these kinds of trends. A lot of articles about avocado toast, about how millennials can't seem to do anything on, not on social media, this kind of discussion. And so we think we, as a school, have a real value to add to this important conversation because we can leverage our unique youth as an old university with a new school and our unique kind of research and personality as an entity to look at this problem in new ways. There are three lenses we'd like to apply to these themes over the next two days. The first lens is this intergenerational one. We are looking at this question of the challenges the governments face from a range of perspectives. And we're really excited that many of you here today are coming at this from a, a place which is a little bit younger than many people who come to conferences at Oxford. So that's a great, a great step. Secondly, we're looking at it through a comparative lens because this question of generational change is similar between countries in some ways, but also quite different between countries in some ways. And we're trying to explore those similarities and differences with our global community around here in the Blavatnik School. And the third lens we want to use is not just the superficial, what are these millennials all about kind of lens, but to really bring our strength as an institution that brings together research and practice and look at that interface between rigorous academic research and world-leading practice in government to see how we can add value to the challenges governments are facing around these generational shifts. So those are the three lenses we're going to apply. And we're also going to try to do a slightly different format than many academic conferences that many of you have attended. So we're really going to try to emphasize the interaction because even though we have so many great speakers coming, we have so many great audience members as well. And the wall between those two categories will be 
uh, problematized over the next few days. So we're looking forward to all of your interactions. And to get us started on that, I thought we might begin with a sl small, quick exercise. And the bad news is that every single one of you has to participate in this exercise. But the good news is that to participate, all you need to know is the year in which you were born. Everyone know that? Good. So I'd like you to please stand if you were born before 1964, 1964 or before. Please stand. Welcome. So you are the baby boom, the generation of boomers. And when you enter the world, please stay standing. <laughs> when you enter the world, it was the end of World War II. It was the rise of the Cold War. China was uh, experiencing a, a new kind of government coming to power. India was, was coming out of colonialism into independence. Partition followed so shortly thereafter. And around the world, the uh, post-war depression gave way to a post-war boom with great growth around the world. It was a time when the first computers were being developed, when jet travel became a commercial possibility, when people began to watch television, when modern consumer culture began to develop, and when we first began to realize things about societal changes around civil rights and other kinds of issues. So boomers, stay standing. <laughs> Please stand now if you were born between 1965 and 1980. And boomers, please stay standing. Great. So, 1965 to 1980, you are Generation X, as you're called. And when you came into the world, the boomers were young people going through education and, and starting families and careers. And this was the time of the Cold War, it was a time of decolonization, of independence movements, it was a time of regional wars, sometimes with great power competition around them. It was a time of economic crisis for many countries, with boom and bust periods tied to oil and other crises. Um, it was a time also when modern environmental issues first became relevant around 1968 and the, the 70s. And also when, uh, around a similar time, the new wave of feminism came to the forward of political conversation, new movements such as the gay rights movement came onto the scene, and a lot of social change began to unfold in places like Woodstock, New York, and here in London. So, Boomers Generation X, please stay standing, and please be joined by everyone born between 1980 and 1994. Right. So, and this time, 1980, 1994, the boomers were entering middle age, Generation X was in their youth and beginning to go through into their careers, and millennials, you were being born and coming into the world. So welcome, millennials. This was a time of the end of the Cold War, a process of democratization across many parts of the world, a time in economics where we saw a Reagan-Thatcher revolution, a spread of neoliberalism in, in global governance and around the world, and of course, a period of reform and opening in China, of accelerating regional deepen, deepening um, in many parts of the world. And you were the first children, millennials, to grow up in houses that likely had a personal computer in them. Um, and you were also amongst the first to experience um, what came next, which was people born between 1995 and today. Can you please stand up? Welcome. So you are Generation Z. And when you were born, the millennials were young people. Generation X was entering middle age. The boomers were moving toward retirement. And this was a time <laughs> moving toward in a very slow, gradual track. And this was a time when uh, history, which had ended with the millennials, came back, um, if you will with a, uh, decades that were characterized by, by war following the 9-11 attacks, wars in the Middle East, by increasing kinds of economic strife following the 2008 financial crisis, and by the reemergence of trends around mon nationalism, populism that we all think about a lot these days. It was also a time of the emergence of the emerging economies, the rise of the BRICS, countries racing to escape the middle income trap, and big questions about how social welfare would develop in this time. But you were also the first generation Generation Z, to grow up completely digitally native. In other words, to never understand a world before smartphones and before the internet. And that is an interesting thing. You're also the first generation born at a time where the world atmosphere has warmed by one degree already in the time you were born, on track to rise much more. So here we are today in 2020, um, and we're now looking forward to the future. And we're going to, in between the years 2020 and 2035, welcome a new generation, the generation after Generation Z, to join us. And we might call them, I don't know, Generation A, because we've run out of letters now. 
But Generation A is going to have a very different world. It's going to be a world where China becomes the world's largest economy in absolute terms, where India becomes the world's populous nation, where Africa is probably the most quickly growing continent, both in population and perhaps in GDP as well, and where our world is fundamentally transformed by technologies we're beginning to see emerge now, like artificial intelligence, like genetic engineering, and like the dominance of the digital space over other spaces that we've inhabited so far. So Generation A will have quite a lot to take on, but they'll be followed after 2035 by Generation B, between 2035 and 2050, when the world population reaches 9 billion. And I'm sorry, uh, boomers, at this point, please sit down, <laughs> because unfortunately, you may not be with us at this time. <laughs> but everyone else, please stay standing. And boomers, you'll be, your places will have been taken at this time by Generation A and B, right? And as we move beyond that, Generation C, between 2050 and 2075, at this point, I'm sorry, but Generation X, please sit down. There'll be a whole new generation, which we can't even predict the kinds of issues they'll be looking at. And by the time we end this century, between 2075 and 2100, there'll be Generation D, a whole fourth generation that will have risen up to take our place. So millennials, I'm sorry, we can sit down now. But Generation Z, please stay standing. So by the time we, our school is celebrating its 100th anniversary, which I'm sure we will celebrate in this very room in 100 years' time, or in um, 90 years' time, you might be back. And you'll be joined by four new generations, A, B, C, and D, who have thought about the challenges of government before. So as you can see, we have a wide variety of experiences here in the room, generationally speaking. And I think those experiences are going to be really interesting inputs for a discussion about the kinds of trends we'll be looking at here. So Generation Z, thank you for lasting this long on your feet. You can sit down. Um, and thank you to everyone for remembering what year you were born. <laughs> well done. Let me just say a few words about the conference over the next few days. So we'll be looking at themes like the future of the economy, changes in technology, changes in the natural world and the environment, changes in identity and culture, and how we manage governments, um, ur cities and urbanization, and also a cross-cutting theme of how we make change. Do we do it inside government or outside government or somewhere in between, and how does that space in and between government work? Um, let me just add a few quick logistical notes. First, we're delighted to have so many of you with us over the next few days, and that means we're going to be rigorous timekeepers, starting and ending on time, so everyone has a good chance to experience the full range of each panel. So I'll ask your cooperation in helping us make sure we start and end panels on time, um, and also to help the people who are watching us through the live stream of this event, so they can know when to tune in and when not to tune in. Um, and that's another important point. This is being live streamed and there's photographers walking around taking pictures. Just be aware, this is happening in the public context. Um, and uh, please, for that, also that reason, turn off your mobile phones, if you can, or put them on airplane mode to make sure we're not disturbing the conversation. Um, we're going to start our next session momentarily with a transition to think about uh, these inside-outside questions and also the role of young people in government. I will turn back to Nari to lead that conversation. But before I do, I want to say one final word of, uh, of thanks and one encouragement is that I was really serious about this interaction piece. We want to hear from each and every one of you. So if you can't find time to make your point or if you don't really feel like making your point in a plenary session like this, please find people in the hallway. Introduce yourself. If you see someone standing, having coffee by him or herself, go up and introduce yourself because we're all here to learn something and to engage with people. And if we all leave tomorrow having met three interesting people who we didn't know before, we'll all consider that a big success. So please join us in that challenge for our Challenge of Government Conference. Thank you very much, and I hope you enjoy the conference. Stay reserved. Am I allowed to give those away? Should I auction them? No. Um, would you like to come up and take, take these seats down here, just so that maximum number of people are comfortable? Great. Well, what, what a pleasure to start today's conversation with um, three speakers 
who have three, th who have at least two things in common with one another. We've got a third who will, who has a short video message. Um, the first, and of course the most important, is their relationship with the Blavatnik School of Government. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll explain their, their respective relationships when I um, introduce them. But the second is that each has the distinction of being the youngest cabinet minister in their region or country. And we thought it would be good to start with uh, these three to open up some of the challenges that, that, that governments are actually facing. It bears noting that there's a number of different reports, like the International Interparliamentary Union Report, which keep telling us that most of the world's politicians are elderly, white, male, but don't, but, you know, they, some of them do a fabulous job, so that's not a disdainful comment. We're starting to sound ageist this morning. Um, but, that, but, but in virtually every country of the world, it's hard to see that those who have been elected to represent the people represent all the different groups in a society which are generational, which are racial, which are by income, which are by gender, and that there's a lot to do to make our representatives look more like the societies that they represent. Our focus, of course, in this conference is the generational divide. So I'm going to introduce each speaker as I introduce them to make an initial remark. But so let me start with the gentleman on my right, the Right Honourable Saeed Sadiq, who is Minister of Youth and Sports in Malaysia. Uh, Sadiq applied to come to study the Master of Public Policy in 2017. I think that was, that yep. was the year. We offered him a place. We could see the leadership potential. At the last minute, he declined to come because he wanted instead to run for parliament in the Malaysian elections, and he very quickly became minister. Um, normally, people do the MPP before becoming minister, <laughs> um, but uh, Syed went straight ahead. And I guess I can't help but ask you, Syed, now that you've been minister for nearly two years, uh, what is it that you wished you had come and learnt before you became minister? <laughs> there would be a lot of things. Um, yesterday we had a conversation about finding a way to maintain one's principles when they join politics, while at the same time ensure that idealism don't get drowned out by pragmatism, because you do not want to lose the key struggles and battles which are to come. About one year and a half ago, Malaysia went through its very first democratic transition of the more than 61 years. Um, so it's not an easy time. We went through it peacefully. But with that comes the need and the drive to push for long-term institutional reforms. But while doing so, if you go too fast and ram into the wall, the fear is that there will be, there will be a big pushback by the electorate which then, when the next election comes, a lot of the key institutional reforms can be ripped apart because we fail to affect and change the hearts and minds of the electorate, which matters the most. So it's not, about, it's not only about institutional reforms or legislative changes, but it's to ensure that attitudes change, hearts and minds change, so that even when there is a change in government, and I believe now in Malaysia it will happen uh, often because that's the beauty of a democracy, but it's to ensure that democratic traditions continue, and that's definitely one thing which uh, I think I'll have a great time learning uh, in Blavatnik. I, I remember when you applied, you'd, been the, you'd won Best Debater in All of Asia three years in a row. So I think on the persuasion stuff, you were already slightly, slightly ahead. But you know, now you're the, you're the youngest minister in Asia, serving the oldest prime minister in the world. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that, that's kind of interesting. So is there a generational divide in Malaysia? Is there, is there a sense that people under 40, people under 30 have a different priority mm. or set of priorities than people in the older generation? There definitely is, um, in many ways. Um, first things first, let's face it that young people in politics are inherently disadvantaged. Why do I say this? They don't have the same networking opportunities like those who are much more experienced. They don't have the same financial resources like those who have been there for a very long time. Uh, the uh, turnout rate 
of the youth electorate in comparison to those who are much older is lower. Um, but if young people are fearful to take up the challenge, to disrupt and innovate, then we'll never get anywhere. That's why I always believe that it's critical to have that critical mass to get more and more young people in, uh, breaking the wheel, not just following the same uh, traditional path. And with that comes the, the narrowing of that uh, age gap of idealism. For example, in Malaysia, I remember when I was pushing for the constitutional amendment to reduce voting age from 21 to 18 years old, which will mean that there will be an increase of 7 million new voters in Malaysia, but a wanted increase in the electorate, there was a big pushback by the older community. It took me about a year to convince my cabinet colleagues and for there to be a bipartisan success, because we've never had bipartisanship win, especially when it comes to constitutional amendment, because we government didn't have two-thirds support. Um, um, so we had to convince the opposition coalition, and that's never happened before. I think just three months before I pursued it, uh, a constitutional amendment was struck down. It was on a less controversial issue, but even then it was struck down. But I remember the point is where you get young people clamoring for it uh, because they want their voices heard. They want to ensure that if the issues of employment and underemployment are taken seriously, they want to ensure that they are not left on the sidelines. I th uh, they, want, uh, they want issues of cost of living to be resolved. They want housing issues to be resolved. These are key central messages which are very close to the hearts and minds of young people. Um, but when they become more and more vocal, absolutely no one can ignore their voice because if they do, they'll be kicked out and they will lose the next election. Is, is there a number one issue for, for young people? Like you mentioned a number, housing, unemployment, cost of living. What, what, what would you say is the, is the sort of number one issue that distinguishes them from the older generation? If you notice, the broad theme is still the economy. Mm -hmm. But for young people, I believe it's jobs, but not just the creation of jobs, but quality jobs. Underemployment is a big issue. And, and you realize that there's a big age gap or ideological gap here where the older generation will keep on telling the youth that, um, or you don't deserve this pay, that uh, you are underskilled or unskilled, that you are too complacent, um, and that, I mean, in, in general, there's this uh, very negative tone um, thrown at young people. But in reality, young people are very, hung they are very hungry for change. They want to take up these opportunities. They want to disrupt and they want to innovate. Um, so that's why I believe if there is no shift in attitudes and, and, and mindsets, I believe there will be a big, I wouldn't say a physical revolution, but there will be a big silent revolution like what happened in the last election when great pessimism targeted on young people was removed by great optimism and young people turned out in droves during, uh, the, during election day and were the ones who defined the very first time change in government in Malaysia. They were the defining factors. And ne for next election, there's an increase of 7 million new voters now, which is one third of the electorate. They will become the king makers of Malaysian democracy. Thank you, Sadiq. Um, to my left is the Right Honourable Kate Forbes, Minister for Public Finance and the Digital Economy in the Government of Scotland. Welcome back, Kate. Um, Kate first visited the school in 2017, um, gave a wonderful session um, here in the school, and Kate, it really is a pleasure to have you back and to um, reinforce your membership of this Blavatnik School family. Um, You've, you studied history at Cambridge and then at Edinburgh and focused on history and, and migration and human migration. And I've noticed that in your time as an MP, you've, you've picked up that issue as well as um, the minister led, um, you know, one of the several things that you've led was the campaign on plastic straws, the environmental issue. So I guess I would, I would come to you first to say, you know, is there a generational divide in Scotland, do you think? Is there, are there a set of issues and priorities that younger voters, that the younger part of the electorate that you represent would put first? 
I think there's quite a profound generational divide in Scotland right now. And at the moment, if you think the constitution runs through politics in Westminster, it certainly runs through politics in Scotland, but it's a different constitutional question. And it's the question of Scottish independence. And I put that out there as the, the major issue, which I believe divides the generations, not completely by any means, but all polling demonstrates that under the age of 35, there's far more support for an issue like that than above the age of 65. But in a sense, I would say that's symbolic of the ways in which the different generations have had to grapple with the same challenges. So whether that's the challenges of post-2008 um, economic uncertainty and risk, how young people have responded is by believing that there could be a better future in constitutional terms, although the point about jobs uh, also applies. And I think, too, the tools of our politics, young people have responded differently. So one of the things that came through the independence referendum, and I think is increasingly dominant in our other uh, big issue politics, is, of course, social media. And again, social media really inspired a whole generation of young people in Scotland, and they perhaps were then more persuaded by the, the arguments on independence. Those sentiments, as it were, are then reflected in those that seek elected office. So if you look at uh, the House of Commons, the party with the most members under the age of 40 are the SNP, and the parties with the most candidates under a certain age are also my party. So for all the, the economic uncertainties and risk of taking political office, when a movement ushers in young people, you really see that being reflected in the numbers that are taking up uh, elected office. And in, in, in representing those issues and people, you know, being, a young, being the youngest minister, what for you are the advantages that come from that, but also what are the challenges? Well, there are certainly a lot of challenges. You, have, you can't expect automatic respect. You have to earn it. And I learned that very quickly, um, I think a few weeks after being appointed a minister, going to do an official engagement. And the first lady who I met shook my hand and said, lucky you getting a day off school. So you have to, <laughs> you have to, which was only marginally better than being mistaken for a very senior male politician's wife. So you do have to prove yourself a little bit more. But I think that if, to Sadiq's well-made point, that in 2015, we um, allowed uh, young people down to the age of 16 to be able to vote. So there is an electorate there, aged 16 and 17, who can vote in Scottish Parliament elections and local authority elections, who are looking for people to support. And they want to see people that reflect themselves and reflect the issues that they care about. And so from that perspective, to answer your question, I think there's a huge opportunity to be a voice for young people. I can't you know, remember the countless number of trite initiatives that have been deployed to engage young people by governments that know their votes are important. And so often they're quite offensive because they treat young people as though they've got little more to say than um, on a few key areas. And I remember taking part in one such event um, on behalf of a committee, looking around the room, this was our engagement with young people, thinking half the people in this room are older than me and I'm elected and they're seeking elected office. So I think the advantage is that there's uh, an electorate out there who want to see representatives like them and are fed up with the politics of the past. But there are, of course, inherent disadvantages of having to prove yourself, particularly when your portfolio includes finance and technology. I'm young and I'm female, two, um, as it were, uh, demographics that are not highly represented in those two areas. Mm, thank you. Now, we have just a very short clip by a third panellist who couldn't join us today, and I'll explain why in a second, but Rafat Al-Alkali um, uh, was the founder of Resonate Yemen, which was a youth democracy movement. Um, before coming to do the Master of Public Policy, yes, there's a theme here, at the Blavatnik School of Government, and then returning to Yemen, first to, to lead the Executive Office on policy support issues, but then to become the youngest minister there of, for um, youth and uh, sports in Yemen. He's now back here 
obviously there's been a war raging in Yemen and he's back here in the school um, working on how you can reconstruct states that are in a very fragile conditions, post-conflict reconstruction and in-conflict uh, construction. Um, and that's what's taking him up today. So he, he's recorded a short video. Could we have the short video comment by um, Rafat prepared for this? Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Blavatnik School of Government. My name is Rafat Alakali, and I'm sorry I couldn't be with you today uh, at the school because I'm actually in Singapore on a course on smart cities. I originally come from Yemen, where I co-founded an organization called Resonate, which works with young people and works on engaging young people in public policy. Uh, Resonate and myself and a lot of my friends and colleagues have been part of the youth movement in Yemen and of the protest movement that happened in 2011. And after the 2011 uh, changes that uh, occurred in Yemen, I wanted to really be uh, influencing from inside the government rather than trying to influence the government from the outside, which is why I came to the Blavatnik School and I did my Masters of Public Policy. And I went back to Yemen after that and joined the government. I was the team lead for policy reforms before being appointed as Minister of Youth and Sports, where I continued in that role until the war unfortunately broke out in the country and we had to leave. And I rejoined the school and have been coordinating the school's activities on addressing state fragility. But today I wanted to share with you a reflection on one of the challenges facing young people uh, in Yemen and in many other countries that I uh, engage with, which is the challenge of organizing and making an impact in the long term. Young people typically have a lot of energy and want change to happen now and are successful in many uh, times in uh, making an impact and making uh, historic changes in their countries in those moments of change. Uh, but the real work comes on the day after, the work of continuing to influence and continuing to drive the country in the direction that young people would like to see it go. And that requires a high level of organizing, of building uh, sustainable collective work um, that channels all the individual actions into uh, a real impact. And building you know, political movements, political parties, uh, civil society organizations, that can continue that work with a real long-term agenda. And in many cases, that becomes very difficult for young people who either have uh, you know, lives of their own, work to go to uh, beyond you know, the, the moments of protest that they join, or are uh, getting co-opted in a way into joining a public office, which while making them able to make an impact from inside government, takes them away from the ability to organize and to uh, build grassroots support and bases that can help them uh, influence the political landscape of the country. And so I think uh, one of the key challenges that I hope uh, would be discussed in this conference is how young people can organize themselves uh, for the long term and to have an impact uh, in the long term. I hope you will enjoy uh, the two days of discussions during the conference and you'll have productive discussions on this and other topics. Thank you. So, so Rafat is, is strongly, um, he's saying something that I'm sure resonates for most people in the room. Um, if you've come up through student politics in your university, you know that student politics is about the quick hit. You know, you're not there for long, you make the quick hit, you move on. And then when you join governments, as these um, fantastic ministers on my left and right have done, you quickly realize that the quick hit doesn't actually change much. It might be a newspaper headline, it might be what politicians like to call an announceable, but it's not actually changing the lives of people. Now I'd like to open up to you to, um, to draw in um, half a dozen uh, questions or very brief comments. Um, to the ministers here on stage. So can I open it up to you? And you'll, you'll forgive me if I interrupt you so as to make enough time for others also to make uh, comments. Great, so at the back. And please introduce yourself. Hi, hello. Cool. 
Uh, I'm Brian. I'm the editor-in-chief of the Oxford Political Review and the MPhil in uh, political theory at Wolfson here. So thank you very much for your sharing, Justin. I'd just like to ask a very quick question concerning uh, a dilemma that I think a lot of youth activists and politicians face in general. And that's if you want to achieve sort of changes to structures and policies in government, you either seem to need to go down a path of entering the actual administration and the establishment, or instead choosing to go down the path of becoming a civil society activist and trying to change the structure from the outside. Um, when making that particular choice of presumably kind of entering the, the former as opposed to the latter, what were the factors that affected your decision making and how would you sort of translate your own experience to, to any messages or thoughts that you'd impart to aspiring politicians and youth in that sense? Thank you very much. And that's probably the question I get asked the most by people coming to the school. Yeah. Which way should I, which way should I go? Other questions? Hi there, I'm James, um, an MPP student here from New Zealand. Um, I be, had a brief question. So obviously you being in a youth representative role um, has a lot of value. You're able to mobilise the youth vote and so forth. Are you able to describe to us your experiences of being unofficially or officially labelled as simply being that youth representative by your elders and, and perhaps not being taken seriously on the likes of finance issues or, or those, those big people topics? Um, I'd be interested in hearing your your experiences. Thank you, James. And then down here, can we have a microphone here? Thank you. My name is uh, Siddharth, and I am an uh, MPP student at Sciences Po in Paris, and I'm here to attend this wonderful conference. Mm -hmm. uh, the question that I have is, when working from the outside, what I've observed is that the grit that you require is so much more mm -hmm. than when you, what you require inside. So you had mentioned that it took you a year to convince the cabinet that this is the direction to move in. But if you're outside, it's probably going to take you 50 years or something of that sort if you want to work on it. So uh, how do you think you would measure one amongst the other when trying to understand if it's better to be in, on the inside or on the outside? Mm -hmm. So another inside-outside question. And then a question here. This lady here. Uh, Selamat pagi, YB. Um, with the stigma, um, as you know, there's a huge... Uh, do uh, introduce stigma. yourself. Oh, sorry. Uh, my name's Carmen. I'm a student at Oxford International College. Um, as you know, with the st heavy stigma in Malaysia with uh, regarding the youth and politics, how would you encourage political adv advertism and engagement in politics and the youth when we are so discouraged not to do anything? Mm -hmm. Terrific. Um, one more question here. Uh, good morning. My name is Kule Duma from uh, Anglo-American. I'm the International and Government Relations uh, Advisor there um, and, are, and from South Africa. Um, so in the work that we do, we talk about the future of work quite often, especially in the South African context with high unemployment and economy heavily dependent on coal and, 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 and minerals. Have you started thinking about what the future of government would be? Because we always talk about the future of industry, but is there space to actually talk what the future of government would be, what a new welfare system for transitioning economies would actually mean? Thank you. Excellent. And one last uh, question. We have the acting, the former acting mayor of Afghanistan at the back, who you'll be hearing from uh, tomorrow. But uh, should I... Kabul, um, Afghanistan, and I relate to a lot of the content that was shared um, uh, from both the Excellency Ministers. Um, I'd like, I like to make an observation and um, uh, share a question. My ob observation from my own experience is that being young, um, relatively speaking, because it's different in different contexts, it's such a high-profile job, I felt it was very limiting because you're labeled as only being concerned with a specific portfolio of the youth. So I had to kind of fight back and not always represent the youth perspective because as the mayor, I had to engage and represent various age categories and, and, and um, uh, demographic constituents. Um, so that's the observation. My question is, um, in your specific jobs, are there times when you have to kind of 
break from that chain and demonstrate that you can represent non-youth perspective and non-youth interests as well. Thank you. We had sort of three themes raised. The first is how you choose between being working outside the system and inside the system, a theme that will also be picked up in the next panel. The second is around whether you're just representing youth, whether it's tokenistic, whether you can represent others as well. A third is around the future of government, which the Minister of Digital will you know, doubtless have some things to say. And I'd like to throw in one further question to you. You're each from countries that um, have a very strong strand of nationalism in your current political debate. Scotland, the Scottish nationalists on the rise once again in Malaysia, um, you know, a Malaysia dignity movement which is causing real consternation among minorities in Malaysia, and it, but rallying other parts of Malaysia. And that's, of course, something that reflects in this country, our host country, at the same time. I think I, I, I probably do need to note that today, the 31st of October, was one of the several dates on which um, Britain was going to leave the European Union. Um, and, yeah, we did it. Should we do it then? Should we not? We, we ended up banking on the unpredictability of the current British political system. But that issue is one which has divided generations in Britain. Some 70% of 18 to 24-year-olds voted to remain. Um, Interestingly, of the 30% who voted to leave, 30% of the youth, um, 18 to 24-year-olds, voted to leave, and half of those, more than half, 64% were male, and, and half of those said that the most important issue for them was their aversion to cultural diversity, right? It was about cultural diversity, immigration, crime and defense. By contrast, that same demographic, the 18 to 24 year olds who voted to remain, put things like education at the top of their priorities. So, and it's just a reminder, so let's not lump all youth together. There are some very clear divides, um, as you would expect among a younger generation. But the, I think the, the, the leave vote highlighted a strand in Britain as well of a yearning for a particular kind of, of national community which, which poses real questions about the rights of a majority to have their cultural integrity, etc., and the rights of minorities and, and, and how we do that. So I'd really like to ask you what your vision of nationalism is for your countries. Tom Hale showed us what the demographics will look like. This is an issue that will define each of your countries yeah. in the decades to come. And I think it would be useful for this audience to hear what, what you think that vision is. So who would like to start? Kate. Well, in terms of vision of na for nationalism, it's interesting. I mean, you will know, I'm speaking specifically about a Scottish context, obviously, but every single local authority area in Scotland voted to remain. So we're coming at it from a slightly different perspective, not everybody, but a slightly different perspective. But I remember speaking to a Guardian journalist who commented, she was based in London, but commented that she hadn't heard a single Scottish politician saying anything anti-immigration uh, in the last three, four, five years. And I would suggest, I'm not suggesting that Scotland is exceptionally good in any way, and I think that there are undercurrents, but I would say in terms of our public rhetoric, there has not been an association with things like immigration or ethnicity with the um, vision for, for independence. Now, there's always undercurrents, and I'm not denying that, but certainly through the, the constitutional discussions we've had around Brexit, immigration has not featured on a Scottish political platform in that respect. A lot of the rhetoric is the fact that we don't want to be taken out of the EU and our future economic prosperity actually depends and relies on people moving to the country. So even issues such as the proposed immigration cap or the 30k cap for, for immigrants coming in would be a problem in a country like Scotland where the average wage is much lower than England, for example. So I would say that 
there's a distinction, although my party is the Scottish National Party, it's not actually the Scottish Nationalist Party, although our vision is for independence, it is a centre-left, uh, inclusive vision for independence, that if you want to move to Scotland, if you choose to live in Scotland, if you want to work in Scotland, you're very welcome and please work with us to make um, Scotland more prosperous. Now, that's not just a party political broadcast, but <laughs> the point is, I think, at a national level, those issues of ethnicity and immigration have not featured in our discussions about independence to the same extent that they've featured in other constitutional discussions. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So, an inclusive nationalism. So, just on this issue of nationalism, Sadiq, yeah. um, is there a risk that Malaysia, you know, there are obvious historic reasons for indigenous empowerment and such like that come from Malaysia's colonial history and other countries, you know, South Africa for one, share some of that. But is there a risk now in modern Malaysia that you're heading towards an exclusive form of nationalism which says that only these Malays, only Malays with this particular visible identity um, have full rights? I think as time passes by, Malaysian politics will become more and more multiracial, but in the next one or two terms, we'll have to make some of the most toughest decisions and toughest times. Last election, as I mentioned, was the first time change in democratic government after 61 years. And when that change happened, the Malay majority actually voted for the opposition coalition today. Um, the government today had less than 30% of Malay support. So there is a perceived narrative that there's a sense of loss in Malay power and interest uh, by this new government. But I think as the new budget reflects, that's categorically untrue. We're still investing a lot in uh, education, uh, opportunities to ensure that the economic wealth can be equitably distributed. But the reason why I say it's tough, because when, that's, when there's that first time change and perceived loss in power, there will be a strong pushback. That's where you see we are also being confronted by almost an ultra-ethnic nationalist coalition, which doesn't just combine race but also religion from opposition parties like PATH and AMNO, forming one of the biggest Malay religious blocs in Malaysia which then compels us in government to respond, and how do we respond? At the same time, we have our uh, support base at the moment demanding for us to make quick, critical changes uh, to what the Malaysian identity truly is. So then, it begs the question, how do we move forward? We cannot simply maintain status quo. At the same time, we can't turbocharge forward to the point that you lose sight on actual democratic pragmatism where you may break the coalition apart or you may um, lose the next election and therefore all the important reforms have been backtracked. I believe the future of Malaysia is that while the youth will be the defining factor, as I mentioned, 7 million new voters coming into the electorate, I firmly believe that my generation is more open-minded and multiracial looking. Right? So they will change the electorate to a great extent. And while racial and religious identity will still be important, right? But people will still associate themselves as Malaysian first. And I believe that the way in which we approach for economic policies on redistribution will not just be on the basis that I'm Malayan, therefore I am entitled to 10 different things, but will be about how do we best ensure that we can equitably distribute profits in Malaysia or wealth in Malaysia towards poor Malays who are affected the most, who are disadvantaged the most. So it will be more on a public policy approach um, which combines need-based and also race-based acknowledging that there is subconscious discrimination uh, which still exists in Malaysia. So similarly, when um, Dr. Srinazi's uh, father, Tun Abdul Raza, envisioned for the NEP, it wasn't meant to be permanent, but there was a timeline. And it was a public policy approach to ensure that Malay equity could reach 30%. And there was an increase. In 1970s, Malay equity was only at 2.7%. There were only about six to seven Malay graduates in the School of Medicine and Engineering in University of Malaya. 
But now we see a lot more coming up. They are professionals, they are in the middle income, uh, uh, in the T20 as well. The point is to ensure that we can redistribute the pie equitably and acknowledge that the Malaysian identity is critical to act as a uniting factor of all Malaysians, but at the same time respect uh, a person's right to associate to a particular race and religion and remain to be proud of it. So it will be a difficult path. It's not easy, as I mentioned, because it's a first time change government. It was an unholy coalition of different ideologies, but we had a common enemy then. Now, we don't, that common enemy is being tried, so it's a different case. And at the same time, when you fully liberated the media, Malaysian media index has improved by far, corruption index has improved by far, many institutional reforms made. But when you free up the space of discussion, again, that's when nothing is hide under the rug and it's discussed in open. So there will be pushback. But I'm optimistic that the youth will win this battle and Malaysia will win and will become a force to reckon with in the next 10 to 20 years. Great. And I, I think he almost said, and that was not meant to be a party political group. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, but thank you. Thank you for answering that. Um, just briefly then, um, Kate, what made you choose between, I mean, did you ever sit, as Brian and others in the room um, have uh, asked, did you ever sit and think, do I work, should I work outside the system or shall I join the system and work inside? Absolutely, I had multiple identity crises. And I started off by working in the system as part of the system, got totally cheesed off, totally cynical, thought politics never changed anything, so left the system and then went back into the system. And after three and a half years, I'm resigned to the fact that I can't change the world. But I've been able to change small things. And I think for me, what I've acknowledged over the last three and a half years is it's those that persevere that change things internally and externally there are challenges to change but perseverance pays off and building networks and alliances pays off and i see particularly amongst young people some very powerful workers and operators who are able to build those networks and alliances who've done more to change politics in six months than i've done in three and a half years but those are the factors that are required whether you're inside or outside so my advice would be um, build those networks, build those alliances, figure out what you're standing for, and then persevere. If you get the opportunity to stand for election, go for it. If you don't, you can probably still see through change. Would you add anything to that? Yeah. Um, because there was almost like a false dichotomy whether you join the government or you become an external pressure force. I'm of the firm belief that the youth must disrupt and continue to disrupt in as many ways as possible. I was a part of the system as well. I was an officer to the de facto minister of law. I witnessed blatant corruption and abuse of power, dined by the government then, decided to speak out, lost my job as a part-time lecturer in the university and as a researcher for the Johor Ting Tank. Um, but instead of just becoming an external pressure force, I said, if I am to join another already well-established political party in the West minister system, it takes years, if not decades, to climb up. You disrupt it, you form a new political party, make sure that those who share the same idealism join on board, at the same time, you enter the election and create a new narrative and message, unite opposition coalition together to win the election. The point is the youth must be daring enough to disrupt and do not fear change by either picking to join the government or to become an external pressure force. I mean, in many countries, we see the rise of youth movements, whether it's within established political parties or those young people who are daring enough, for example, in Thailand to form the party of their own. And and and, and just, do you ever feel tokenistic, the question on tokenistic? Was, I mean, 94-year-old yeah. prime minister, 26-year-old minister, it sort of reduces the average, you know, yeah. sort of brings the average that to was kind exactly of... Where, where, yeah. where, where I was going to go. I'm honestly privileged to have that 94-year-old prime minister mm -hmm. because if he did not care about youth issues, he would never bother to appoint a 25-year-old minister. But beyond that, enable me and allow me to bring millions of other people into the political front line. When we amend the constitution from 21 to 18 years old, he was one of the biggest driving forces. When we reduced the age of youth from 40 to 30, he was a driving force. Paid internship, now reality in Malaysia, he played a role. Decriminalization of drug addiction, he played a role. 
a landmark 6.5 billion job stimulus plan which targets youth who are, who are unemployed, he played a big role. The point is, the way in which you remove tokenism is to ensure when you are in power as a young person, you don't only focus on yourself, you bring millions of other people with you on board. Now we see a lot of young people being appointed as CEOs and chairmen and board members of the big corporates in Malaysia, PNB, a multi-billion dollar portfolio is being run by a 36-year-old. In the National Economic Action Council, one of the most pivotal economic units in Malaysia, chaired by the PM, has three people who are below 30 being represented on board. Government agencies who were previously run by those who are 50 years and above now are run by those in their mid-30s. So the point where you bring all of them into the front line, then even if I lose power, and that's the beauty of democracy, we normalize young leadership in every single layer of decision making. That's when tokenism fails and youth empowerment is institutionalized. Thank you, Sadiq. Kate, one, um, one quick word from you about the future of government, given that you are Minister for, for, for Digital. Anglo-American done a lot of work on the future of work and digital, etc. Yeah. Just and I think young people are pushing that future in, in particular. Um, really briefly on that point, I'm not the Minister for Young People, I'm the Minister for Finance, and I prove my worth by being Minister for Finance rather than being Minister for Young People. And you've got to earn it. Nobody's going to give you anything on a plate in that regard. And I think you don't get special privileges by virtue of who you are or what age you are either. In terms of the, the future of government, it's one of the most fascinating areas that we're looking at at the moment in terms of digital. And there's quite a lot of research going on at Edinburgh University that we're partnering with in terms of how we use digital methods to, um, a, I suppose, empower people when it comes to participation and voting. All the parties are falling over each other in terms of reaching young people and all ages through, through digital means. But I think that's come with an element of suspicion and questions about ethics too, which have probably set the debate back several years in terms of digitising participation and democracy, particularly in recent campaigns, um, which you can read into what I'm saying in that regard. So I think that debate's moved back and we need more work done to build a consent and the ethical framework for how we change government before we change government. But if we don't get the ethical framework in place, then as I say, with parties trying really hard to overtake one another using digital means, we're going to get into even bigger uh, difficulties. Thank you very much. Look, we've, we've run out of time on this session, but just before we close, lest we end on a kind of ageous, let's lump everybody into categories thing, I do want to point out that one of the best applications I've seen for a doctorate at Oxford came from an 85-year-old applicant who wanted to begin his new career in academia, which I thought was terrific. Um, one of the um, people I have taught that felt that they were too old to change course, I mentioned to a couple of you last night, informed me that, that um, he was too old to change course. I said, but you're, how old are you? And he solemnly said, I'm older than you think. I'm 19 and three quarters. <laughs> and I love it when, you, when the three quarters still matters. Um, the, the, the point is that, that we've called this, this conference the new generations because the new generations is not just about age. It's also about mindset. Um, and that's why we've called it the, the new generations. We had a visitor to the school last week who introduced himself as a 17-year-old who just happened to be in a 74-year-old body um, and remonstrated with me for the fact that the school does not have a presence on TikTok, which um, apparently shows that we're already too old. Um, so I just wanted to finish with that note to say everybody in this room is um, a new generation of sorts. And, um, and we're now going to, I'm going to hand over to my colleague, um, Emily Jones, who is going to moderate or animate I should say we were told last night don't moderate don't 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 calm people down animate <laughs> get people going um, on this question that we've already raised this morning on inside versus outside where do you work within the system which which is true if you're if you're an 85 year old trying to work out where to change the world or a 19 and three quarter year old working out where you want to change the system 
But could you join me in a huge vote of thanks to the Right Honourable Kate Forbes and the Right Honourable Sadiq Syed, who have come all this way. Thank you. Thank you. Fabulous. Fantastic. I can already feel the buzz in the room and all the conversations, but we're going to keep it in plenary till coffee break. Let's, let's get going. There's a, has everyone found a seat or a standing spot? Okay, great. So the previous session teed us up nicely for this session. Inside or outside, how do we make change happen? So I'm Emily Jones, I'm an associate professor here at the school. We have a fabulous panel to help us discuss this. A lot of experience I know in the audience. Um, so our panel, we have Nick Alderdice, who is the chief product officer at change.org. We have Yemi Bamington Naishi, who is the founding shaper, or the founder of the shapers, maybe we'll put it that way, at the World Economic Forum. Um, and now you're running a, another organization, um, called the president, you're the president of United People Global, which you'll tell us about in a second. And Jeremy Roberts, who's an MPP twice over, a member of the provincial parliament in Canada, in Ontario, and a former uh, MPP as well. Um, before I turn to our panel, tell us a little bit about how they're making change happen and what, how they've decided about going, whether to sort of pursue an insider or an outsider strategy. Let's come to you in our audience first. Quick straw poll, how many of you have been making change happen more in the inside, sort of working within public sector organizations? Or if you're at the beginning of your career, how many of you envision yourselves within on an inside path? How many of you are more inclined to an outside path or have been working on an outside path? So insiders, hands up. OK, so there's a, quite a lot of people on the inside. Great. And outsiders, who's an outsider here? Okay, great. Thank you very much. And we're going to come back to you. So just, we're going to have a very interactive session. So just one thought, one insight you'd like to share about your strategies, what you've learned about making change happen, or one question that you've got for our panel. Just get your thoughts flowing. I'm now going to turn to our panel and ask you each to tell us a little bit about what you're doing and how you're making change happen. And then we're going to, we're going to probe a little bit deeper. But um, should we start with you, Nick? You're kind of a... On the outside, if you like, on this. And then we're going to come to Jeremy and then Yemi. Sure. So the thing that animates me, more people more involved in the decisions that affect them at a local, national, and international level. There is kind of a meta trend of a concentration of power, I think, uh, in whether that's government or, like, multinational corporations. 
and an apathy amongst people kind of participating in their communities. And um, I think that that is like one of the most dangerous trends that exists in the world today. And I think that through technology, we have the opportunity to give people like more access, more opportunity and more ability to shape their communities. So that's uh, why I do what I do. I'm at change.org. Change.org, uh, about 100 million people every month use change.org to take action on issues that they care about them. 100 million people every month? Yes. That's quite a number. Okay. Just, uh, thought, just to make sure I got the number right. <laughs> uh, and uh, that's uh, largely through collective organising. There's like organising around petitions, fundraising, working together. Um, you know, there are lots of really big campaigns about very big weighty issues. Um, in the last week, there have been hundreds of thousands of people mobilising to uh, support the uh, KPK, the anti-corruption commission in Indonesia, as it comes under political attack. Uh, and there have been millions of students in the US mobilising to try and get a day off school after Halloween. Uh, and so... We're <laughs> we, really making change happen. Yes. It's the important things. Uh, um, and so we really do see kind of public and civic participation in all its forms. Uh, and uh, that's how... Uh, yeah, that's, that's what I do. That's what so we do. For you, it's really about the citizen's voice is what's got to be the process. Why did you choose for yourself that? I think a couple of things. Like one, the issues that animate me most are global in nature. And I think that choosing an inside route um, often involves committing to uh, nationalism or like at least a constituency that uh, as someone who comes from Australia, I care about Australia a lot. Also, Australia's got it pretty good. Uh, the biggest issues in the world, I think, are multinational and that like cut across global boundaries. And I think the means of influencing those uh, kind of on the inside are not necessarily, they're definitely there but um, there are narrower opportunities to do that. Um, I think I'm an impatient person, uh, and the pathway to influence in government is a long one, uh, particularly in Westminster-style systems. Um, and I also think that when we look at the big issues, whether it's climate or otherwise, uh, governments are increasingly, I think, being shown up as ill-equipped to address those in a way that like, has sufficient urgency. And I think that we need to be looking at like at what it is what it is that could lead to potential step changes in some of these big problems. And I think at this point, I believe that that's more likely to come from the outside. So last night over dinner, I was worried that we we're going to have a consensual debate here. But he's just told <laughs> everybody's on an inside track, including you, Jeremy, who I'm coming to now, that actually re the real change we need can't happen on this inside track. So falls in your court. What are you doing and why have you chosen a more inside route? Well, like? thankfully, it looks like I have a couple of friends in the audience. So let's, let's uh, uh, you know, I'm going to need your support here. So uh, my name is Jeremy Roberts. I, I was really privileged to uh, be able to do the MPP program back in 2015, 2016. And what sort of drove me to get involved in, in public service, public policy, uh, is actually my younger brother. Uh, my younger brother, he loves potato chips, he loves Barney the Dinosaur, he loves swimming. Uh, he also is nonverbal autistic, has a severe developmental delay, and suffers from epilepsy. So over the course of my life growing up, my brother's challenges uh, posed a lot of uh, hurdles for my family uh, in accessing health care support, social services supports, education supports in my uh, home province of Ontario in Canada. And uh, so I, I remember very vividly when I was about 14 years old, uh, my family was going through a crisis point with my brother. Uh, he, we couldn't keep him in school because he was having violent outbursts. He was having tantrums at home. He punched a hole one night through his wall, bedroom wall, into my room. And, uh, and so I decided, you know what, I'm going to get involved. I'm going to go and protest outside the provincial premier's office. So that's our version of a governor. And uh, so I went with the group, and we were protesting. And as I walked outside with my placard and listened to the speeches, I thought to myself, why am I doing this? Why don't I get in there? Why don't I figure out how I can you know, get involved in politics, influence the premier from the inside, be part of that team. And so that set me on a track in politics. And I got involved in politics that year when I was 14 years old, started volunteering on campaigns, uh, ended up working for the federal finance minister in Canada, working on a national autism strategy. And then after I completed the MPP, uh, was uh, decided to throw my own hat in, uh, into the ring for elected office and was fortunate last June to be elected as the member of provincial parliament
for Ottawa West and PN, which for those keeping track, that makes me Jeremy Roberts, MPP squared. <laughs> and um, and uh, so, so since June, I've been working in elected office and uh, was, was really blessed this past summer to be appointed as parliamentary private secretary to the Minister of Social Services, tasked with working on a revamp of our Ontario autism program. So for me, it, uh, you know, I had that moment where I was on the outside looking in and then decided, you know what, going to change tracks, try to see if I can fight it from the inside and feel like I, I've been uh, doing okay so far. Okay, so. and I'm, we'll let you tell us a little bit more about that in a few minutes Sounds about good. how you've made change happen from within. Yeah, I mean, you've been somebody who's moved between spaces. Right now, United Peoples Global is a sort of outsider strategy. If, with positive disruption at the heart of it and positive action. So yeah. tell us a little bit more. Right, thank you. I think that uh, when serving on the inside um, is kind of impossible um, or less possible, maybe it crosses certain lines for you. Now, where I'm from, my family has made a decision to be outside. So that's long before I got involved. Uh, my mother did have to serve at some point. But even that was a family conference call before she could take it. So when I went back on the inside, um, before that happened, there were sev several family conference calls, and I was allowed to go in on a strict um, uh, basis. Uh, and I agree, um, because sometimes serving on the inside compromises you in certain ways that uh, just affect your sleep at night. Now, um, at the same time, I'm really happy to be here because we don't have to convince anybody here about the value of public service. Um, and I love that. That's part of the reason I came. So thank you, Naomi. Um, I think you, the easiest way to understand me, because some things happen to me, and my mom is like, let me tell you something I remember, to kind of calm me down. And so she talks about coming to pick me up from nursery school. I was barely four. And when she gets there, I was kneeling down facing the wall. I was being punished. And that day, the person in charge of the class wasn't just any nursery school teacher, although they're all great, happened to be the head teacher of the whole school. So my mom is particularly unhappy. And the, te the head teacher says, your son beat me with a cane. Now my mom's mortified. She walks over to me and says, Yemi, is this true? And I'm kneeling down facing the wall. She said, hey, you were really calm. You leaned back and said, yes, mommy. She was beating other children. And I wanted her to know how it feels. <laughs> now my mom goes back to the teacher who, complain, who explains that she was disciplining other students. I had nothing to do with it. And I came out of nowhere, grabbed the cane, and started beating her. <laughs> now, anybody who's worked with me, and you can check my resume, it's probably, <laughs> everywhere I've been, I can't change who I am. And so I, I just have to do something when I see injustice, when I see any kind of thing that isn't right. I like to say any Fortune 500 CEO will tell you, and they'd be really proud, and please raise your hand if this has happened to you before in your organization, where they say, I want you to pick up the trash. Don't say the trash belongs just to the cleaners. If you're walking around and you see trash, pick it up. Have you <coughs> heard something like that before? Please, I'm sure you have. But somehow, in many of these organizations, they want you to walk by when you see your colleague crying. I don't get it. I spend more time at work than I do at home. If I see a colleague crying, that's unacceptable. I don't care if you're in my department or not. You need to know what's going on. And so, whether I like it or not, people have always sought me out, put me in a lot of trouble, when there's something that has nothing to do with me. Um, now, to come back on point. I just say, so I encourage us all to be disruptive. It sounds like you started at a very early age with that disruption. No, but okay, to come back us, on yeah. point, I would say disruption for equally unsatisfying to me. For some people, that's okay. Um, part of why I'm in this is because you want to see tangible change. And when you're barred from being on the inside, but you want to serve, your mind is thinking about how to be part of change. And so part of why I've chosen outside the strategy is because there's so many ways to be on the outside. So many ways to be on the outside. But I've also learned that change is a team sport. We need people on the inside. Absolutely. And if you're on the inside, you need people on the outside. If you happen to find yourself in a period where you cannot be on the inside, 
for various reasons, your family says no, or there's a party change in power, right? Or there's some policy like locking people up in cages that you disagree with. I encourage you to come on the outside, but you must do two things. One, be part of positive change. You can't just say I'm not involved. So there's ways to contribute from the outside. So one, be part of positive change. Number two, be part of making it possible for you or people like you to be back in on the inside. Because we always need people on the inside. If you're on the outside and you're not doing one of those two things, please let me know your reason, because I think it's unacceptable. <laughs> How do you really get me <laughs> All right, so let's run with that thought. Let's run with the exploration of the outsider strategies. Okay, so let's probe that a little bit, and then we're going to come back to the how do we make change happen from within, and then we can talk about how to join them up a little bit. But probing the outsider strategy, and I'm calling on people that are particularly pursued this route in the room as well to share their thoughts, but you've mentioned a range of strategies, and I'm going to come to you, Nick. What does that look like? So we think of outsider strategies, we think people on the street, right? And I'm just thinking, look at, think of now Chile. We've seen a lot of people on the street in Chile the last few weeks. We think Sudan, the regime change that was brought about by very courageous people taking to the streets. But what is the range of outsider strategies and when do we, what, when, what makes them effective and when? And then perhaps what are the limits to outsider strategies? So really give us your thoughts on this outsider strategy space. Yeah, so the thing I want to echo and build on is uh, rarely does an outsider strategy work without like yeah. partners on yeah. the inside, yeah. um, and same vice versa. Like both are necessary. Well, not always, but both are necessary, but um, insufficient. Um, uh, I think when people think about outsider strategies, it's often about the big public mobilisation, and I think that that works in two unique situations. One, it works where it's drawing attention to something that was otherwise like didn't have focus. Um, time and time again on change.org, like the campaigns that win are basically bringing focus and attention to something that just previously was flying under the radar. And all that needed to do was raise the salience of that and focus attention. And once that was done, then like partners on the inside who have good intentions and like the general public who may not have considered how this issue was affecting them um, come together in a way that like br um, brings change forwards. I think the second case is where uh, uh, there is um, too much inertia associated just with like the progress that's being made on the inside, and there needs to be some sort of catalyst. Sometimes that catalyst is uh, about like exercising power. It's people on the street. Sometimes the catalyst is about a certain story that captures attention. And so an example of this one, um, uh, I think there's a, increasing amounts of polarization in the world, people are increasingly like dismissive of alternative ideas, not because they're bad, but because they like come from the other side. And I think there is a power in personal story that we increasingly see. Like an example from Australia, um, where uh, for a long time, the idea of medical marijuana, um, just like not something that would even be considered, um, and ended up being progress on that from a conservative government because um, a uh, parents, uh, there, there was this young man who had terminal cancer, um, who a uh, certain type of um, uh, marijuana oil um, helped treat seizures associated with his treatment. Um, and his parents, one of whom is a former policeman and the other of whom is a nurse, um, found themselves in the position of being his drug dealer um, and could go to jail for being his drug dealer. Um, and their story and like their integrity in their like lives, in who they had been, um, reframed that issue and kind of allowed it to cut through in a way that was like um, not partisan anymore and enabled progress on that issue. And so that's what I mean when I say it kind of catalyzes um, something that had too much inertia or too much, um, uh, too many barnacles associated with it. Um, where, where it doesn't work, um, I would say, is like where um, there actually just isn't enough power. Like there is an enormous number of like vested interests uh, in the world and um, when those vested interests kind of match up uh, with the ability to popularly mobilise, the ability to shape public opinion or the ability to cut through, like if it's not there, then it can be um, worse than send you backwards mm -hmm. to like try and force attention on something. Um, and I think it also doesn't work when that partnership doesn't exist, when there aren't the people with good intention and alignment on the inside who are able to partner and help take things forwards. Great, so it sounds like a lot of this is really drawing attention to issues, making the human side of it really compelling, but then a real question about the limits to these strategies. People in the room who've got experience of working on the outside, 
we really welcome some comments. Anyone who's skeptical about the outsider strategy and wants to ask a question or a challenge, then I invite three or four comments now or questions. Keep them concise and please just say who you are. Gentleman at the back there, yeah. Hi. Um, very interesting. Thank you. Um, I wonder how you end up... I'm the editor of the Madras Courier. It's a digital publication, um, and uh, we write a lot about public policy and stuff. Um, how do you fund these things? You know, the, whether you're inside or outside the government, funding is a major question. And uh, it... Yes. Let's bring a couple more... Shereen. 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 Yeah. From outside, disruptive change. Yep, lady here. I'm going to come here. Yeah. One. I'm Rosafa Okimira, uh, Secretary General, Ministry of Local Government, Government of Kosovo. Uh, I would like. I, I mean, I'm working inside, so I just want to uh, ask a question. How do you maintain the balance uh, with outsiders and not letting yourself be a bureaucrat? Uh, and how, what's the relation with outsiders, especially with those who are staying neutral and not encouraged to be active? Great. So as an insider, how do you relate to the outside? Yeah. Maybe in the middle here. Hello, thank you for this discussion. I'm Ivana from Ukraine. I'm MPP alumni from Cambridge. And now I, I came back to Ukraine and now I'm a volunteer for an NGO uh, working on the civil service reform. And what I face, like what I see in our work is that we, even though we are outsiders, we perceive ourselves a bit of like war jogs and something like that, we can't survive, like we can't d drive change without the insiders. So I would, be, I would be grateful about some examples of successfully doing outsiders jobs without the insiders? Like, is it possible without this balance? Or is it impossible? Like this, because I see that it's impossible from my perspective. Thank you. Okay, great, thank you very much. And let's go, I can see Jeff in the purple shirt at the back there. And then we'll, there, there'll be more chances to ask questions. I can see a lot of contributions, one from the floor. Uh, Morning, my name is Roberto Vinhais. I'm from, originally from Brazil and uh, from the outside. Uh, my decision basically was don't do anything with the government, do it all by yourself and try to build a template that others can use. It, I don't think it's a solution for everything, but it's been working well so far. What exactly you're doing in this outside uh, To establish the uh, art foundation uh, to sponsor arts and help Brazilian artists to, to get to live and to get exposed, exposure in Brazil and outside. Okay, great, thank you very much. Let me come back to our panel, and I'm gonna come, I, sorry, there's a, I can see another, you put your hand up three times, I can see you've got an urgent point to make, please do, come in, go on, I'm breaking my own rules here. But. Okay, uh, my name is James Boimo Rogers. I write on some of these issues. Um, how do you deal with outsiders and who uh, have legitimate aims or objectives, but end up, really um, trying to put others out, down. I'm thinking of people like Trump, or I'm thinking of people like the nationalists in Hungary and other places like that. They do have some legitimate uh, um, um, uh, objectives, yeah. but that objective is really um, from looking at people who are already in power in the majority um, being in a position to suppress um, other people who are from the minority and a weaker position. Great, thank you. So, how do you, so in a way you've got a lot of contestation on the outside and how do you adjudicate if you're on the inside between these competing claims coming from the outside as well? All right, let's come to, and I come to Jeremy now on this because you've said on the inside but I know you've got a lot of thoughts about as an insider when it can be useful when outside strategies work and when they yeah. don't. So a few of these me, questions. Let on. me try and tackle the first two questions because I think the latter two are better from, from Yemi and Nick. But the first two questions about how do you divvy up resources. Um, as somebody on the inside who, who's part of the political world, when I'm thinking about political issues that, that we're going to put on the agenda, we're typically looking for three criteria. 
We're looking for issues that are salient, uh, that are out there, people are talking about them, people are aware of them. We're looking for issues that are personally relevant to people. We want it to be something that if we take action on, a voter at home thinks, oh, you know, they're taking action on this thing that will impact my life. And the third thing we're looking for are issues where we can differentiate ourselves from our political opponents. Um, so those, those three issues, if you can tick off those three boxes, I feel like a government is more likely to act on it and to, uh, to divert resources towards it versus other issues. So I think in this broader conversation, um, where the outside can be particularly impactful is when the outside is able to demonstrate that an issue ticks off those boxes and bring the issue, perhaps make it more salient or demonstrate by sheer numbers of people who are perhaps protesting or engaged that it is personally relevant. That, I think, is where the outside can be impactful where the outside has limitations are on those issues that don't necessarily tick off those boxes. Um, you know, I'll, I'll draw again on my own personal experience. The issue of supports for individuals with developmental disabilities, it's not as salient as climate change, economy, jobs, health care. Um, it's personally relevant to the people who it's personally relevant to, but perhaps not for the broader populace. And on, on differentiation, you're not going to see a huge amount of differentiation between parties on an issue like that. So I think those are the issues where you need somebody on the inside who, who is able to kind of put it on the agenda forcefully using their agenda setting power. So that, that's the first question. The second one, very very briefly was on, um, you know, what uh, uh, the second question was around uh, outs outsiders. Um, How do you maintain balance? How do you maintain balance? Yes. So when I'm looking at uh, an outsider group, I'm looking for them to behave in a particular way. So a successful outsider group, in my opinion, follows a wheel. So it starts with a clear and concise ask of government, moves to pressure, that involves a number of things, writing to politicians, meeting with civil servants, might involve protests, petitions. And then if the government takes action of some sort, that group provides praise. And then they return back to the top to ask. And they work around that cycle. And the outside groups that I think fail get caught or miss one of those three parts of the wheel. Um, so that, that tends to be how, as an insider, I'm expecting outside groups to behave in that way, and that's when I'm more likely to act on something. So clearly articulated demands, pressure, and then remind, reminding to yourselves to praise government when they actually follow through on what you've asked for. There's some other questions on the table about the effectiveness of outsider strategies. Yemi, do you want to pick up on some of these yeah. questions? Um, I think for the four questions we heard, or five, mm. I want to remind people that the whole idea that change is a team sport. So you're working with people, both on the inside and the outside. And um, there are very few things that I would say are in that public domain that you can go off and just do by yourself. I don't think that's a good idea, um, in my experience. I think that uh, there's slippery slopes on both sides. So on the outside, the slippery slope is to think you don't need um, you don't need other people and you're just going to do it. I remember an example of a bunch of activists who tried to uh, rebuild the old cultural walls outside the city of Kanu in northern Nigeria. And they did it by themselves. I mean, it's almost a fairy tale. When the rains came, their walls got washed away because they didn't have enough resources to build them really well. And so they went back to the drawing board and tried to see who else they could engage. If you want more on that story, I can connect you with those people. Um, but on the inside, there's lots of slippery slopes. And I was a technical advisor for economic growth. I'm going to hold you on that one. We're going to come to the insider in a Okay, so let me leave that. Slope. But let's stay on the outsider strategy and how to make them work. And whether you can ever get an outsider strategy to work if you don't have an ally on the inside. Like, how do you find those inside allies if you're on the outside and build that team? Yeah, I think we need to, especially since we have lots of insiders here, we need to raise the general understanding that changes the team sport. So if you on the inside are looking for people outside you can work with, that helps. Now, people on the outside, government isn't the enemy. And I'm very sad to say, when I was in school of government at the Kennedy School, across the bridge was the business school. And my God, it really was like those were evil people across the bridge. <laughs> I'm not kidding. You really felt that way. So much so that when I cross-registered for a class, I felt like a traitor every time I crossed the bridge. <laughs> 
That is the wrong way to think. Absolutely the wrong way to think. And so when we get to the inside of slippery slopes, I'll tell you. But on the outside, if you're thinking that's the enemy, that's wrong. Now, some of them are extreme. But guess what? You need the extremists. Because the extremists help the more reasonable people find a path in. So he's not going to work with the extremists. But then he sees your organization, you guys are more reasonable, he'll sit down and talk to you, right? So it is a team sport. And I would say integrity is key in everything you do. Don't fake it. So if it comes to you to be extreme, try not to hurt anybody, but go ahead and do that. If it comes to you to actually negotiate and work with people, occupy that ground. And together, we will make change happen. So inside, please look out. But outside, recognize that people on the inside, they are good people there. Lots of good people who are looking for a way to do something. And to find them, I like to go through their resumes. Look at what they say. A lot of the good people, the way sometimes good people survive in bad ecosystems is they keep their heads down. They try not, not to say too much. But quietly, they do good things. You can find them. Look through their background. Look at things they did much younger. And you know it's in there somewhere. Then you have a strategy of how to speak to them, who to speak to them, to bring it out. I've learned how to make change happen. You won't find too much of me online, um, but I've learned how to make change happen without being in the room. So as an outsider, it's such a powerful tool. That means giving up credit for some of the stuff you've done, but it's not about you, right? Right? <laughs> it's not about you. <laughs> So the most important thing is to focus on what you're trying to change and think who can change it. And if you're playing the game at that level, you will have many more wins. Yemi, you're, you're shocking all the politicians. <laughs> <laughs> it's not about us. <laughs> Heaven forbid our egos would get but in the way But especially from the outside. Strategy. If you really want to change something, it's not about you. It's about the change. And it doesn't matter who's going to move the but needle. But I think you've added something to our agenda here. So we've got the kind of raising stuff and the, the salience of things, getting people really engaged, getting the politicians to pay attention to it. But then you've got to have the dialogue with the insider. Yes, you've you got to find, really find the insider. And then it sounds like what you were saying, you've got to have a clear set of asks and a sense of what actually we've mobilized this big set public sentiment, but we've got to think about what that yes, translates. Thank you. And just, just to tag on to that, one of the things that really decimates the outside is the infighting amongst the outsiders. They fight for funding. They fight for like, you know, visibility. They fight for everything. And it's just, you, if you take a step back, it's like, it's just it's such a, it doesn't make sense. It really doesn't make sense. So I would say for those who are on the outside, that's something else you have to be very careful of. We put our, what we focus on, we put it online. If you want to copy us, people often come and say, can we use your four Cs? We're like, hell yeah. And if you want to give us credit, that would be nice too. But if you don't want to, just use it anyway. Right? Um, but a lot of people fight each other. But the sky is big enough for many birds to fly. So if you take my funding, I'll go fight funding somewhere, somewhere else. Right? Yeah. You just keep working. But anyway, I would say that, that, that fighting between outsiders is, is probably one of the worst things for people on the outside. And then, Nick, your final thoughts on this sort of outsider strategy. And I'm going to then turn to the audience for questions on the insider and all of you for your reflections on the inside. Slippery slope or a way to make change? Um, Nick. Uh, I think the first thing I would say is uh, um, hopefully you, some of you may have heard of the concept of the Overton window. Um, this is the idea that uh, um, what is the acceptable middle ground shifts based on where the extremes are. Uh, and I think this is like a very legitimate strategy when um, it's not necessarily, maybe the existing, there aren't necessarily people on the inside who agree with you on all cases, but well, how do you use an explicit strategy to, get, to um, pull the debate in a certain direction to make the middle ground seem like actually closer to where you might originally want to land up, uh, end up? So I'm on the board of an organization, we're fighting for um, paid parental leave for everyone in the US. Um, one of the only countries in the world that doesn't have it, uh, and uh, and we have explicit strategy to like move the debate in a certain direction in order to create space for compromise um, that may not end up being us, um, that may end up being someone else. But Nick, can I push, push on that a little bit? Because we've seen a lot of people take to the streets. I'm thinking Occupy movement. A lot of people were really angry in the wake of the global financial crisis. They took to the streets, and a lot of people would say, actually, it really just achieved nothing. Yeah, right? and, and I think... Extinction Rebellion now, again, there's a real concern. Well, actually, is it going to deliver? They don't have the clear asks. Are they actually affecting change? Are they really moving the Overton window? And I think that this is an, a really great example, because I think that uh, with, when looking at Occupy, for example, it's relatively easy to draw a direct line from the uh, focus that they placed on economic inequality 
to the direction, the policy direction of the Democratic Party in the US right now. Like the Democratic Party as a whole has moved substantially to the left in the way, and, and the uh, salience of economic issues and um, uh, economic justice in particular is like central to US political debate in a way that just wasn't true 20 years ago. And so when you look at Occupy, yes, like maybe they didn't kind of have any direct policy asks necessarily achieved in that moment. When you look at the kind of, when we step back in 20 years time and go like, what were the cascading effects of the amount of attention that was placed on this issue? Um, I think that it's uh, entirely possible that we kind of see some very big results as a result of that. And, and my hope is that Extinction Rebellion is the same because I don't know about you, but I don't have a huge amount of faith in our political system to solve the climate cr crisis um, at the speed at which it needs to. Uh, and so having a, um, a, a group um, and a movement that is saying like, actually we need to treat this with the seriousness that it deserves, and that means being extreme, like, uh, if that's what's required, I don't know. If, if something else is working, I would love someone to talk to it, but it doesn't seem like we're making progress in many other ways. Now, before we say good to the inside, just very quickly take it back. Very quickly. Really yeah, you raised the point, which I really, I want to flag two things on the outside. So the fact that very often outsiders don't have an ask, I think that's, that's, that is a big problem. A specific example, how many of you follow the yellow vest movement in France? They call them the gilets jaunes. Now, Obviously, I study this stuff, so I watch all the time. For weeks, they were proudly telling people, we have no agenda. People said, what do you want? Well, I mean, they were protesting against the speed cameras. I know that sounds a bit strange now, because they have a few asks now, but please go back and check it. <laughs> For weeks, they were proudly saying, we have no leader and no agenda. That's not always the best way to make change. You need an ask. The second floor, I would say, and this happens every day. Next time you go online, you'll see it. People are so keen, especially on the outside, to say what you don't stand for. And while that's powerful and exciting and energizing, I would say if you're really trying to move the needle, it's equally important to say what you do stand for. And I, that's, it sounds so sensible when you hear it, but I promise you, go online today, go online tomorrow. Every single day, people say what they don't stand for. And it isn't always obvious what they stand for. So I would say define that is something else that makes the outside powerful. It comes back to what Jeremy said about having a clear ask. And knowing what you stand for is exactly one of the attributes that Kate flagged in the earlier thing. Was, so it's in, in really important to think about not just what we stand against, but what is the actual positive change we're looking for. Um, what is the change we want to see? All right, let's segue now to uh, the insider strategy, and I'm going to come to the floor for questions and contributions. Before I do so, I'm putting two things on our agenda for today and tomorrow. The big changes, the systemic changes, we've got several sessions on climate change. How do we make change happen with these big systemic issues? By the end of the conference, please let us know. Um, we, we've got more than, we've only got 15 minutes left for this. I don't think we can solve that one. But the other one is the regulation of big tech, right? So Nick's told us something which was, where you've got big vested interests, it can be really hard to, to change the dial. Think banking crisis, global banking, there's big vested interest there. Think global digital, there's some really big players. So how actually do we regulate effectively some of these big spaces where there is a big concentration of power? All right, let's come to the insider strategy. Um, we've heard quite a little about, a bit on the panel about quiet inside strategies. Um, we've also heard about the political moves of actually become, taking the political route, becoming a minister and making change through um, the politics. Nina's got her hand up. Right, let's come. There's lots of contributions. So I'm going to try and sweep the floor a little bit, and I'm going to... This corner is very quiet over here, so I'm going to come over here in a second. Um, let's hear from is it Nina. Just had her hand up. Yeah, you got the mic. Good. All just right. Hi. Briefly, who oh. you are, and then your question. Yes. Hi, my name is Nina. I come from uh, Denmark. I sit on uh, what we call the Youth Climate Council uh, there, and that's why I'm here. Um, but on a day-to-day -day basis, I work in the European Parliament. So I have the the great joy of being both working in, on the inside and then also being incredibly frustrated with the inside um, as I work sort of on the climate agenda. And I think the debate. It might be a bit sort of uh, has, the, has, has the wrong perspective here because I think it's always a question of what is it that you want to change. So, and then, so that's what you need to figure out first. And then from there, then figure out what are the best alleyways. So I think, you know, as Jeremy was saying, you know, if you have a, an issue um, as, the, as autism, then it might make sense for you to go work, um, you know, in, you know, through science, but also through politics, it might not make sense to go demonstrate. 
Um, and for me, working on the climate agenda, I very much agree with you, Nick. I don't see the change happening. But what I do see is that politicians, they are moved. They just swing by what will make them elected. You know, so whether that's money in some countries um, or whether that's public pressure, um, that is what, you know, is going to, to determine what actions they will take. Somebody asked in the earlier session, do I take an insider route or an outsider route? And what you're saying is figure out your issue, figure out the change you want to see in the world, and then look for the right avenues. Um, great. Let's come. Come on, there's going to be more thoughts over this side of the room. Come on, yeah. Gentlemen there. Hi, uh, John Kerbal. I manage the research team at Oxfordshire County Council. I had this wildly complicated question that I'm going to try and simplify, which is how insiders and outsiders can, in a time of kind of austerity, retrenchment and polarization, support the brokers, the entrepreneurs, the kind of people who don't get a wage from lobbyists or, 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 or big pressure groups and don't get a wage from institutions, but need to be there to turn the utopian rough around the edges solutions of the outsiders and the deep understanding of why it's really, really hard of the insiders into a space where action happens. Great. You've added a new category of brokers, which are the sort of the people that are helping make that outsider demand real. And they're not on the payroll, which is an interesting thought as well there. Thank you. Um, let's come up to the back here and then we'll come forward. Hi, Annabelle Margreff from the National Leadership Centre in the Cabinet Office. Um, so last night I was speaking to a colleague about how when people enter into the civil service they become centrists. Generally everyone in the civil service finds themselves becoming a centrist and I think that speaks to once you do enter the inside you see the scope and enormity of the system both in breadth and depth and I think your hope for large scale change changes or reduces. So my question is, what's your advice to that? And what is the antidote? Thank you very much. <laughs> Incrementalism, is that the only route if you're on the inside? OK, there's a, yeah, I'll come to you with the laptop here. Can I get a mic? Thank you. Thanks, Lucy, just here. And then I'm going to, if you could give the mic to the lady stood at the back with the blue shirt on that side, we'll come there. Yeah. Thank you so much for the session. Uh, my name is Vinay. I work as a maxillofacial doctor in Northwest London, and I was a secretary of a political party in my constituency, North uh, Northwest London. I won't say which one because I, I left last year, and that's about my question. Um, I've I've always told that there's no substitute for maturity, and of course, young people, especially in the UK, want to get involved with politics. I'm finding. However, what I found with myself is my values kept changing. As I grow up, my values are changing. As I get different life experiences, my values are changing. So working on the inside may not necessarily be, be the best thing because, as you said, you become compromised. But I, I just wanted to ask about, again, about how, when is the right time to go on the inside? Because I can see a great scope for change, but at the same time, you become compromised. So. If that, if that asks articulate well. Compromise and integrity. Right, you have the last question, and then we're going to come back for your panel. And we're going to have to continue this over coffee break and over the next two days. But yes, please. Hello, my name is Yeo Kai Mudzi, and I'm at the Saeed Business School. Yemi, something you said struck a chord. Sometimes serving on the inside compromises you in ways that cause you to lack sleep. I'm originally from Zimbabwe. If anyone knows anything about Zimbabwe, you would understand why that strikes a chord. And so I'd like to ask a question that within contexts like that, when does it become necessary or unnecessary to enter the system? And how do you make change in what has been seen as dysfunctional for your full life span? Thank you very much. It's a really important question. I'm going to come to Jeremy because in a way you're, that's your, you've chosen this insider route. How are you making change happen? How do you do it on the inside? And do we have to give up hope if you're on the inside of any real systemic change? Yeah, I, I'd like to tackle the two questions here because I, I think the answer is, is quite, quite similar for me. I, I like to think of myself as a relentless incrementalist. Um, that, uh, that, you know, when, uh, when, when I made that decision when I was 14, 15 years old to choose the political route, I knew that I wouldn't be making change overnight. I knew that there was going to be a long path ahead that I would have to 
for lack of a better term, play the political game and, and figure out how to climb up the ranks. And so I started volunteering on campaigns, got a junior staff role, switched into a minister's office, climbed up the ranks there, came to Oxford, got a degree behind my name, went back, ran for office, and now climbing up the rung as an elected member, you know, with, with the goal, of course, of, of reaching a point where you are in a decision maker point of view. So I knew that it was going to be a long game and that I may not see the day-to-day -day change that you might get when you're working on the outside, but if I, I, I felt that if I could reach a point where I was a decision maker, I would have a better chance at getting that big change. And so it, it really is piecemeal, you know, over, over my career there was the, uh, when I worked for the finance minister, we got funding for a national autism strategy. We put a group together, they developed the plan, and then there was a change of government, and the new Trudeau government decided not to fund our national autism plan. So, you know, you, you, you two steps forward, one step back, but now I'm in a new position that I wouldn't have been in were it not for the work I had done previously, where I'm now getting a new chance to impact change on a broad level. So I, I do think it is incremental, and I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing you do have to work through the uh, through the steps on your question about um, you know choosing the political route um, it's something that uh, I think a lot of people young people struggle with because they don't necessarily identify fully with one political party or another um, you know I, I I'm, a, I'm a conservative member of Parliament back uh, back in my country and I, I always say to people that find me a politician who agrees with absolutely everything their party is doing and you found a liar uh, because, <laughs> because because it, it is hardly ever the case you know I'm I'm not going to sit up here and tell you uh, anything that I disagree with because as, as a party member there's party solidarity but of course there have been times when I've been uh, challenged with, with something my government has done where I've thought hmm I'm not sure if I was the decision maker that I would have done that same thing um, you know but ultimately you, you face a decision at that point um, do I leave the party and uh, in, in my particular government we had a member of, of my, my party caucus who left the government and became an independent member of parliament and she got about a week of really great media coverage that brought attention to her issue and you know she was a star in that particular community that she was fighting for but I can tell you now she has no influence she doesn't come to government caucus meetings and get to review new legislation and make comments on it. Uh, she doesn't get access to the premier. She doesn't get access to the ministers. And so, you know, uh, in a sense, I, I think she made the wrong decision in that particular instance. Uh, I've always chosen to stay on the inside because I think I can have the greatest impact on the issues I care about by being on that track and, and continuing to move can forward I like that. Ask you one question, which is a broker question. Are there ways in which you as an insider looking for change can actually leverage on the outside? Because we're sort of thinking this is outsiders pushing government officials, but there's people on the inside who want change. Oh, yeah. How do you work with the outsiders effectively? Oh, absolutely. I mean, if, if, I'm, if I'm working to, uh, to impact change, I want to pull together my stakeholders. So, for example, the work I'm doing on autism right now, uh, we're trying to develop a treatment program for individuals with autism. Treatment for individuals with autism is very expensive. We're talking eighty, ninety thousand dollars a year per, for a family. Uh, and so um, originally the government kept coming out with this is how we're going to deliver it. And then the autism community would come back and say no that's not how you should deliver it. So finally I pitched to the minister and I said listen we have a budget, $600 million for this program. Let's pull together a group that includes parents with kids with autism, uh, clinicians, researchers, service providers, uh, individuals who have autism themselves who are adults. Tell them you have a $600 million budget give us recommendations on how to spend it and actually yesterday we received that report and so now now our, our plan is to figure out how to implement it so uh, absolutely you need to pull in that that uh, that support because then it allows us to get a win when we act on that report we have a whole slew of stakeholders out there to hit that third thing on my wheel the praise 
which again is, you know. We like your praise. I, I, we do. We like our praise. But I think what's important exactly. there is to think about as an insider how to cultivate your outsider constituency and work with them and finding those brokers within. I'm going to come to Nick now on this question of sort of from the outsider perspective, how do you, what does effective work with on the inside look like for you? Where are those effective alliances? And to pick up on some of the questions. Then I'm coming to Yemi for the, the slippery slope questions and some of the, whether, should you resign? When it really gets difficult. So heads up, Yemi. Yeah, so uh, I think it's, um, it, it's finding the right partners. I, I, I'm generally someone who's optimistic about humans. Most people have good intentions, and so it's about finding those, um, th those shared commonalities and, and uh, looking for those opportunities to engage. I, actually, I want to come to this question around uh, like incrementalism and, um, uh, and, and like what the antidote is, it, is to it and like whether or not it's just inevitable that you end up kind of in centrism and incremental pragmatism. Um, because I think that from my perspective, like the antidote to that um, actually really sits in listening and empathy. Uh, I think that it is uh, way to, as, as, as long as you're talking to people who are like directly affected by really like big problems um, that like you may have some ability to do something about, like it is hard to start from the question of what's possible. So go, this is an unacceptable situation. Like when you're talking to uh, a mum whose daughter has just been locked up for life for a non-violent drug offence, who's working three jobs a week and who has lost like um, two kids to police violence, kind of starting from the question of well, what's possible in the system, like is just a much less relevant than what's acceptable for us to try for. You know, if I, if I could say, like, there, there, if I was in charge of a public service, the first thing that I would do is I would say it is absolutely 100% mandatory for every single person in the public service to spend at least two or three hours a week doing nothing except interviewing and listening to, their, to the people that their policies affect, mm -hmm. purely with the job of empathi empathising, understanding how their lives are being affected, um, not knowing exactly how that might translate into policy, but knowing that that will bring an urgency, knowing that that will bring an empathy, knowing that that will, I think, bring an ambition to the amount that we're able to achieve in any particular way, because I think it is way too easy for the elites, and I think this is one of the biggest, like, kind of movements, is, uh, is kind of a disconnection from the elites, from the reality of what people's lives are. It's way too possible to over-intellectualise what's possible, to over-intellectualise, like, this is just the way the system is. Like, yeah. It doesn't have to be that way. And it's a really important reminder, I think, as well, that a lot of the people who are affected are not those who mobilize on the outside, right? So actually, unless we consciously engage with and really speak to the people with, for whom that are affected by our decisions, some of them will mobilize, but actually, that's often the more elite groups that mobilize. Totally. And none of us here so are actually really on the outside. Yeah. Like, we're all insiders. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, the fact that you're sitting in Oxford right now yeah. is like, uh, yeah. says that like, we're all on the inside so in some way. So taking a sort of insider strategy or an outsider strategy, how do we really keep a dialogue and an empathy and an understanding and a listening ear to the people who are structurally outside of where we're sitting? All right, Yemi. I'm just dying. But let me start with it. <laughs> no, but I love what he said. So to the centrist question, I was working on the top floor of the Ministry of Finance in Nigeria. I was on the inside. Every speech that the finance minister gave, and anything the president said related to the economy between 2010 and 2011, I wrote. I was inside. And it struck me how many people there, like he said, are just disconnected. They are disconnected. And I don't know how many of you sometimes feel like you work in a place where you're not working for the people, you're maybe working for the elite or the godfathers or the son. I mean, definitely in many societies that happens in government. And I felt that. Now, I like his point, although I had a different strategy to achieve the same thing. I suggest that why don't we have a dashboard where everybody who walks into the building can see how the rest of the country is living that day? Because frankly, they didn't know how much power people had last night. Right? We all moved around in air-conditioned cars. We had power all the time. The entire country generated 4,000 megawatts of electricity. Hello. I mean, I'm like, people... Well, assumed by all your friends in, in well, their... No, restaurant. nobody uses that. You can do nothing with that, right? Yeah. So everyone uses generators. I used to still go to the markets. Of course, almost nobody I was sitting around went to a market. Somebody did that for them. Right? I had a fellow young person who came in. He had all his ironing and everything done. I still ironed my shirts. So of course he had no clue whether the power was stable or not. So staying connected. I would also say, I hope that answers this, the, the centrist question. Stay grounded. Someday I want to get in there before we close. Public service 
is also a family sport. So don't try and do this on your own. Get some family behind you. You need that kind of support for those days when it's too difficult, when you can't sleep. Now, if you're not that lucky with your siblings or your parents, friends and family too, right? Build your own family support. So it's too difficult so you're going to do this alone. Somebody talked about how do you get along the brokers. Use them. One of the biggest things I was proud of, I know this is almost live, anyway, but it's very often the ministers trust the advisors. They don't trust the civil servants who are there to take a long-term view, do all the work. So part of the things I was really proud of was I made sure we used the civil service that was in my domain. And if I got called into a meeting, I called in the head of the department who wasn't invited, but I dragged them in. And one of the institutions that was completely forgotten was the National Bureau of Statistics. Now, thankfully, sometime I would say end of 2010, beginning of 2011, all the official government stats would say National Bureau of Statistics. Before I got there, it always said something from some external body. I was like, we have, and I went there, and these guys were supremely competent. But they knew the politicians were not competent, so they just kept their head down and were doing their work. So I'd say, if you want to support these people, use them. Bring them into the conversation, quote them, all of that stuff. Now, to your point about, your question was, uh, how do you make change possible when it looks like it's been that way all your life? Was it something like this? Yeah, really dysfunctional. So, you know, when you choose to go in, when you just see this civil service that just looks so dysfunctional, you just, your heart sinks. Like, yeah. if you're going to go in. Try and connect yourself. So ask yourself what is possible. And the reality is change, when it has to happen, is going to happen with or without us. Now, it is a privilege to be part of that change in our lifetimes. So ask yourself what is possible. And if you can get for yourself your own answer to the question, what is possible, then you will be looking at any issue with fresh eyes. Now, I used to teach statistics to graduate students as an undergrad. I loved math. And it really helped me. Because one of the things you realize from stats is it's all historic. Now, of course, the trend line is there for a reason. But it's still historic. And sometimes we mistake what is historic for what's possible. And so having the confidence to be able to wade into stats and think about it differently, I'm always able to step back and ask what is possible. Now, there's some beautiful things you can do when you're on the inside. And so many people here on the inside. I would say, please, number one, increase transparency. That whole thing about people governing for the elite or not governing for the people, you can help reduce that by increasing transparency. There, there's a reason this building is made of glass. Yes. I love that. I would say that's number one uh, on my um, list. I would say number two yeah. is increase the politics of engagement. So what Jeremy said, bringing people together to talk about an issue, that is really crucial. It helps everyone govern better. And if people get used to that, when you are no longer inside, people will ask, hey, why is that not happening? Um, number three, I would say, of course, if you can avoid corruption. So I got offered, I was in charge of fiscal incentives. Do you know what that is, roughly? So duty waivers, tax waivers, I got offered bribes. It was ridiculous. Even from people who studied with me overseas. Right? They got appointments because they had a friend in a high place. So they come intimidate me. Yemi, use your muscle. And I explain, listen, I'll make sure your file gets treated. Right? But I don't need anything for that. That's my job. So to the extent you can do that, that is awesome. Now, some slippery slopes. And again, I spent time with very good people. We're all guilty of this. And this is where it's good to stay grounded. Slippery slopes, number one. We know better. If you haven't heard this before, we know better happens to all of us. You've looked at the problem long enough. You've thought about it hard enough. So you think you know better. Please engrave that somewhere. Good people do bad things because of that reason. Number two, we don't have enough time. The president of the country in Nigeria at the time announced, because everybody was upset with the National Petroleum Company, he announced, this is all on record, that we were going to do an audit of the Nas Nigerian National Petroleum Corporation. And he wanted it done super quick. Minister of Finance, that's his portfolio, he called us in. The top guy at the time, one of his aides, said, all right, I've lined up these three companies. Um, they, we can collect bids from them. And uh, one of them, I think this guy's probably the best one to do it, because we have to get this done in a quick turnaround. And I was like, no, that's not the right way to do this. Yes, you get it done. But in a year's time, somebody's going to ask about how we did this. And all of us, with good intentions, would have done something very, very bad. So let's do a public tender. Let's follow the rules. We can have shorter timelines, but we must go public. 
and these three people you like, tell them to bid. It's not that complicated. It wasn't rocket science. But a good person, and this guy was a good person, suggested something bad because he thought we didn't have enough time. Now, that's something bad in a year's time could have gotten all of us fired. Because yeah. the president would go, kind of long got to ask that. So on the inside, I would say, that's a slippery slope to avoid. We don't have enough time. Okay, um, we don't so. have enough time. <laughs> <laughs> so but, we're going to have to pull this to a close. But I hope it's given you a lot of food for thought, a lot of conversations that you want to start with, a lot of fascinating people that are in this room. Police, from, I'm going to hand over to Tom, who's going to give us directions for what next. Coffee's outside, but maybe, Tom, do you want to say your piece, and then I'm going to thank my panel. Yes, we'll do that way around. So thank you for a fascinating discussion of inside and outside. We're going to have a coffee break now and come back into this very room at 11 o'clock sharp. You'll hear this big bell ringing outside. 11.30 sharp, I meant to say. Um, so come back for that. I should also say one quick point. Um, after every session, you have a form in your packets, which is an evaluation form, so you can jot some feedback down there so we can make sure we are improving and getting better and better over time. And we'll come back after an our final... And yeah, some recognition and praise from, for Jeremy would be great. Um, but the other important thing to say is that our lunch break will extend until uh, half an hour longer than usual, because unfortunately, um, President... Uh, Mayor Pete Buttigieg, who is going to give us a video, the campaign pain wasn't able to get us that video in time, so we're not able to show that to you today. We have some written comments that we can share with you, though, if you like. So we'll extend our lunch break by half, half an hour. So see you back here at 11 o'clock sharp. Thank you. So whether you're on the inside or the outside, last piece of advice. <laughs> I've told you. You can make change whether you're in or out, whether you're resigning, but you don't give up. If you find yourself in a difficult spot, right, and you can't find a way to stay inside, then I'm going to beg you to resign. Why? So, number one, if you're sticking around for too long, a few bad things can happen. Number one, you burn out. Don't burn out because we need you. And this is particularly bad for people on the outside. Don't burn out. That's a capital offense. Number two, don't let anybody kill your passion. This happens a lot on the inside, too. If you find your passion is dying because you're following reasons or like protocol and stuff, call me, all right? I'll help. I'll connect you with people. That can't be allowed to happen because we need you. And then number three, don't get disillusioned. You got in this game for a reason, right? And you come in, don't start thinking it really just isn't possible. Again, if you really have that problem, get in touch. We need a book of life lessons. <laughs> <laughs> All right, but please stay in the game. Please stay in the game. Thank you. <laughs>